I am the Philosophical Bachelor and today I want to talk about Cosmic Consciousness. Richard Maurice Buck took many years to write a book to tell us something about what most of us supposedly will not be able to understand. He succeeded since Cosmic Consciousness, a study in the evolution of the human mind published in 1901, is not difficult to comprehend. In it, he writes about how some among us can and have attained cosmic consciousness, the term he coined for what other traditions call enlightenment, nirvana, brahmic splendor, or the kingdom of God. He was a psychiatrist, a man of science, though after his enlightenment experience when he was 36, he was also a mystic. In the first part of his book, Buck lays out his theory and then in the second and third part, gives us almost 50 examples of people who either definitively have cosmic consciousness, probably did or at least got close. Some of the names we will recognize since they comprise the founders of the major world religions such as Jesus, Paul, Gautama, the Buddha and Muhammad. Though he names only one Hindu person specifically, for want of a lack of a historical record of the others, he talks about Hinduism frequently throughout the book. He tells us about thinkers like Plotinus, Lao Tzu, Francis Bacon, Socrates, Blaise Pascal, Baruch Spinoza, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau. He includes famous writers and poets such as Walt Whitman, Dante Alighieri, Alfred Tennyson, and Honora de Balzac, and mystics such as Madame Jeanne Guyon. Despite such a cast of luminaries, the book is not lengthy and has come to be considered an important text in the study of mysticism. To be clear, Buck does not tell us how to achieve enlightenment, and as we will see in his numerous examples including his own, the enlightened have various paths though it is Buck's aim to draw out what is common among them. Buck believes that while the accounts he reports are diverse, they are all more or less unsuccessful attempts to describe the same thing. They appear to be talking about different things because of the inadequacy of our language, which is the language of ordinary human beings. It has to be in this ordinary language since its message is for ordinary people. For the enlightened who did not write themselves, such as Jesus, Gautama and Socrates, they are reporters who themselves may not have been enlightened can only report what they can understand, which is less than and may differ from what the enlightened have taught. Before I proceed further, I want you to know that in a way, Buck's book is not about religion or God, but in a way, it is completely about religion and God, though not in the commonly understood way. I think it is better understood as a work that is about the spirituality that human beings can attain. Such spirituality need not be religious, though in a way, it is profoundly religious, if we can separate what is meant by religious and spiritual from its common usage in organized religions. Let us begin and then it will become clearer. But things that living things evolve. Some have simple consciousness like plants, insects and lower animals, while human beings and perhaps higher animals have passed through the stage of simple consciousness to develop self-consciousness. While human self-consciousness may seem to be the peak of animal consciousness, he believes there is yet a higher level of consciousness he calls cosmic consciousness, which those who have achieved self-consciousness can yet attain. Simple consciousness is the immediate sense perception that all animals and plants possess. They sense their environment, but they are unable to think or reflect about it. They react immediately to it and are immersed in its immediacy, reacting to stimuli based on instinct and the responses of their nervous system. The animal is conscious of the object which he sees, but he does not know he is conscious of it, while self-conscious beings are aware of themselves, explained Buck. Self-conscious beings are able to step outside of the immediate to reflect on it. They can consider their own position in the world in relation to the things of the world. Buck suggests that the evolution from simple consciousness to self-consciousness happens through a three-stage process of percepts, recepts, and concepts. When we see an object, we form a percept, 
a single mental image of the object perceived. When we have many percepts of the same type of objects, say of leaves, one of a ginger plant, one of a chrysanthemum plant, and one of a banana plant, and so on, we can stack these percepts on top of one another, abstracting what is common among them to help us identify a future leaf we may encounter. This is a reset, and when we give the reset a name in the form of a word, it is then a concept. In this case, the concept leaf, L-E-A-F. Bach thinks the ability to form words, that is, language, is key to bringing self-consciousness to the high level possessed by human beings. While conceptual thought seems to be a high point of our intellectual abilities, composed of many recepts, which are themselves composed of many percepts, Bach proposes that the combination of many concepts lead to intuitions, which are composed of many concepts, recepts, and percepts, together with elements drawn from our moral nature. Whether today's science bears him out on the evolution from simple to self-consciousness is unimportant. He wrote it over a hundred years ago, and it is not the main point of the book. The main point is the evolution from self-consciousness to cosmic consciousness, where our minds move from the conceptual level to the intuitional level, where we simply intuit or know the truth without learning. For instance, 1. That the universe is not a dead machine, but a living presence. 2. That in its essence and tendency, it is infinitely good. 3. That individual existence is continuous beyond what is called death. The cosmically conscious person gains an enormously greater capacity both for learning and intuiting while gaining tranquility and an ability to enjoy life and the world and as is taught in Buddhism, is able to let go of the grasping condition of mind and heart. According to Buck, the evolutionary step from simple consciousness to self-consciousness first took place in just a few human beings before extending to all other human beings slowly over hundreds of millennia. Likewise, he believes that the evolutionary step from self-consciousness to cosmic consciousness takes place first in a few and then later to many others, also taking a long time. He charts this step with just very few of his examples taking place in the first millennia of the Common Era and then more in the second with the most in the 19th century. Analogous to how earlier human beings were only able to see two colours and later generations, more colours than the millions of colours we are able to see today. Or how earlier people only had a limited range of sounds they can hear with music coming to us only recently. He thinks that the first people to attain cosmic consciousness will also be able to assess its gifts only to a small extent with later attainers more and more. I do not know if he is right about human visual and auditory abilities in the past. He does cite some sources, but anyway, I think we can take his point that humankind's abilities increase over time and it's not all fully formed at the start, the way it also is for children to develop their abilities as they progress towards adulthood. What is this attainment of cosmic consciousness like? Buck suggests that the attainment takes place in a sudden illumination where in that moment, it is as if the scales has fallen from one's eyes so that one is able to see through to the heart of things. Hindu and Buddhist accounts of this as penetrating the veil of Maya or illusion to get to the true reality. In the words of Edward Carpenter, cosmic consciousness is a consciousness of the universal and divine. Buck writes, This cosmic consciousness shows the cosmos to consist not of dead matter governed by unconscious, rigid, and unintending law. It shows it on the contrary as entirely immaterial, entirely spiritual, and entirely alive. It shows that death is an absurdity, that everyone and everything has eternal life. It shows that the universe is God and that God is the universe and that no evil ever did or ever will enter into it. He adds, All things work together for the good of each and all, that the foundation principle of the world is what we call love, and that the happiness of every individual is in the long run absolutely certain. For those wondering how the problem of evil is overcome by the cosmically conscious, Buck points us to Spinoza's answer. Because God lacked not matter for creating all things, even from the highest degree of perfection onto the lowest, or more exactly thus, 
because the laws of his own nature were so vast as to suffice for producing all things which can be conceived by an infinite understanding. Or in the words of H.B., who is an example of the possibly enlightened, are they odd but different strains in the great cosmic melody? After this moment of enlightenment, the person is transformed with an intellectual and moral elevation. He may try to teach his newfound knowledge, but it is difficult to tell the unenlightened what true reality is like since we only have the language of self-consciousness, which is inadequate to the task of transmission and also because we are mired in the knowledge and paradigms of the self-conscious. While Bach does not mention Plato's allegory of the cave, it is fitting. In this cave, the subjects are chained and unable to turn their bodies and heads. All they see are shadows on the wall, and they mistake these shadows for reality. One manages to escape out of the cave and sees the true light, which blinds him at first, but after he gets accustomed to it, he sees the true reality. When he returns to the cave to tell the others, they do not believe him. Indeed, they cannot even understand what he is talking about because they only know the reality that they have experienced in the cave. A great deal of this is, from the point of view of self-consciousness, absurd. It is nevertheless undoubtedly true, writes Buck. There will be an antagonism between those with cosmic consciousness and the merely self-conscious because the self-conscious either cannot understand or is not ready for what the cosmically conscious has to tell them. They may elevate them to the status of gods or denigrate them as insane. Even those experiencing illumination may, after the event, wonder if they have dreamt it or have lost their sanity. As Balzac points out, our self-consciousness is simultaneously a glory and scourge. In its glorious aspect, it creates societies, but in its harmful aspect, it prevents people from becoming enlightened. The enlightened tell of things unknown to us, and they are morally transformed. However, even prior to their enlightenment, they already are earnest seekers of truth and God, having engaged in long study or spiritual practices such as meditation to advance their spirituality. By study, I do not mean education. They may not have much education, such as Whitman, Jesus or Muhammad, but have the intellectual ability and affinity to contemplate deeply. Moreover, what matters is not just knowledge, since with the senses and intellect of our self-conscious being, we already have a report of the world, but it is in our moral nature that settles at last the significance of what exists. As Plotinus writes, thought is a mere preliminary to communion with God. Prior to the Enlightenment event, the candidate already has a good physique, good health, but above all, he must have an exalted moral nature, strong sympathies, a warm heart, courage, strong and earnest religious feeling, Buck tells us. He does not think one can pursue enlightenment as a goal to be achieved, though one can set up the preconditions for it. As has been taught in the Hindu text of the Bhagavad Gita, all we can do is to do the work, but we must not expect the reward. If it comes, it comes, and we can certainly set things up for success, but whether it finally does turn out successful is not something in our control. Another comment is due at this point. Some drugs have an effect similar to enlightenment, where all the secrets of the universe feel as if they have been revealed to their users. However, it can be expected that such revelation is only an illusion since its users likely neither possess such earnestness towards advancing their spirituality before the event nor exhibit the intellectual and moral elevation post-event that are unique to the enlightened. After enlightenment, the enlightened gain a sense of immortality, losing their fear of death. They lose their sense of sin and shame, believing that everything is for the good. As Whitman writes in Leaves of Grass, Omnes, omnes, let others ignore what they may. I make the poem of evil also. I commemorate that part also. I am myself just as much evil as good, and my nation is. And I say there is in fact no evil. They become changed, exalted in their intellectual, moral and even physical character, where their appearance improves and is transfigured. They have an added charm such that people are attracted to follow them. It is not that they become omniscient, 
Just because one has become conscious of the cosmos does not mean one now knows everything about it. Buck writes, If it has taken the race several hundred thousand years to learn a smattering of the science of humanity since its acquisition of self-consciousness, so it may take millions of years to acquire a smattering of the science of God after its acquisition of cosmic consciousness. The cosmic sense also manifests itself differently in different people. According to Paul, to one is given through the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, to another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another miraculous powers, to another discerning of spirits, and to another interpretation of tongues. Yet when one of the enlightened teachers, he does not give lectures and charity, that is, either intellectual or moral gifts, but that when he gives, he gives himself, according to Whitman. Buck tells us about other characteristics of enlightenment also, some more dubious than others. He thinks that it happens in mature people, typically over 35 to say around the age of 50. We can understand this since a person's intellect and spirit needs to develop with enlightenment coming, if at all, to persons at their mental and spiritual peak but also not too old as their spiritual and intellectual abilities may decline. He thinks the sudden illuminations happen more frequently in spring and early summer as it is the season of nature's rejuvenation. He thinks it happens more in men than women, with most of his examples male, though he does have several examples of enlightened women also. As with the case of much of philosophy, let us retain what is useful and discard what is not. After enlightenment, it is not the case that the enlightened being goes to heaven. They remain walking the earth and breathing the air with us, but at the same time walking another earth and breathing another air of which we know little or nothing, writes Buck. They remain with us, teaching or carrying out their work with a renewed and higher level, such as Balzac and Whitman whose writing ability had a leap post-illumination. As Whitman's biographer, Buck tells us that Whitman's central teaching is that the commonplace is the grandest of all things. The enlightened are able to view the world as with fresh eyes, gaining a new appreciation and wonder of what might have become plain and ordinary. Buck writes, The man with cosmic consciousness is the same needle, but magnetized. It is still fixed by its center, but besides that it points steadily to the north. It has found something real and permanent outside of itself towards which it cannot but steadily look. The enlightened become more spiritual, but that does not mean they become more devoted to their religious affiliation. They may altogether reject their previous religious beliefs, though their faith deepen. Buck thinks that unless a man's spiritual life past the orthodoxies and conventions, he shall in no case enter into cosmic consciousness. While religion in its organized form may be important and even necessary for those with only self-consciousness, it will be shaken off when one achieves cosmic consciousness. Buck believes that there will come a time when all human beings will have achieved cosmic consciousness the way all human beings have achieved self-consciousness today. Then, as he writes, all religion known and named today will be melted down. The human soul will be revolutionized. Religion will absolutely dominate the race. It will not depend on tradition. It will not be believed or disbelieved. All intermediaries between the individual man and God will be permanently replaced by direct unmistakable intercourse. Each soul will feel and know itself to be immortal, will feel and know that the entire universe with all its good and with all its beauty is for it and belongs to it forever. In conclusion, Buck has told us of the desirable preconditions that when in place prepares a person to make the leap into the attainment of cosmic consciousness. However, is this attainment a gift from the gods or if we wish to refrain from such language loaded with the association of organized religions, is it something given to a chosen few by a higher power? Or is it something that comes from within us that evolves out of the avant-garde? The most advanced is spirituality among us in a sort of chemical or molecular rearrangement somewhere in the cerebral centers of our brains. 
Many of Buck's accounts of people attaining enlightenment reference God or angels communing directly with them in the case of Jesus, Paul and Muhammad. While some such as Whitman's is more communion with nature and his fellow human beings, even as he speaks of God also. And for Gautama, a sudden dawning realization, divine but not theistic. Moreover, Buck talks about how it is like an acquisition of a new faculty, like a new sense in addition to our five others. Imagine how it must feel for a person previously unsighted to suddenly gain sight. Throughout his theory, he speaks of evolution, where the ones more advanced are the first to make the next step to the next higher plane of consciousness, in this case, the spiritual side of ourselves. Thank you for listening to The Philosophical Bachelor.